my talk. If subtests are the best, if you were expecting something else, this is what you're going to get. My name is Dmitry Chukin. I work at the Cactus Group as a backend developer. Um, I have been working there for a couple of years previously. I worked as a math teacher, and I spent a couple of years learning Python, doing free online tutorials, working on some projects with friends. Um, and now I'm at Cactus. Uh, Cactus, for those who don't know, is a web development company in Durham, North Carolina. We specialize in web apps, projects using Django, as well as a few other uh, projects not specific to Django. So that's what we do. OK, uh, testing is important. So uh, testing is important because we want to make sure that the code works. We want to write tests that uh, are actually there for a purpose. We want to make sure that our actual code runs the way that we want it to. We want to make sure. Uh, at Cactus, we write lots of tests um, to make sure that when we upgrade to new libraries, we know when deprecation warnings uh, tell us something's going to be deprecated. We want to use tests so that uh, we know when something actually breaks without having to rely on the users in production code. Uh, plus, if I can catch a bug in my code, then I'm not using somebody else's QA time to uh, actually find that bug, and I'm not relying on users because uh, then nobody's happy. So testing makes uh, our code more efficient, and it reduces our technical debt. Great. So we all agree testing is important. We should all do tests. But this talk isn't actually about tests. Specifically, I'm talking about subtests. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. One more thing about testing. Um, so the rest of this talk is mostly going to be about how tests, uh, good tests are readable, thorough, and dry. So number one, readable. Uh, we want to make sure that other developers who are getting to our tests actually understand them uh, without having to spend lots of time digging through them, checking each line, making sure they understand what each of the variables mean, things like that. We want to make sure that they're thorough so that we're testing our functions, our classes, our endpoints. Uh, we're not just checking that they exist, but that they actually work the way they're supposed to. And we want to make sure that they're dry. So we don't want to be writing the same lines of code in multiple places. Uh, by the way, these principles are taken from uh, the Zen of Python, so like readability counts, beautiful is better than ugly, explicit is better than implicit, and there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Um, so the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about why subtests make our tests more readable, more thorough, and more dry. Okay, number one, readable tests. This is an example. Let's say we have... Um, a site with users, they each have a profile, and the profiles can follow each other. So we might want to write a test that uh, in our model we can have, um, that we have correct statistics for this. So uh, as you can see, okay, let me see with my pointer, there we go. So at the top here, I define some profiles, and I have a bunch of asserts that uh, when profiles are created, then no one's following any, anyone else. So, okay, that's easy, that makes sense. Uh, we should probably add a section where people actually follow other people. So, in our test, we might add another section. Okay, so a lot of lines of code. This is our original section from the previous slide. And then we've added some followers here, and we have a lot of asserts for those followers. Uh, by the way, I'm not expecting everyone to be able to go through each of these lines uh, right now and say that, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, the point of this section is just about readability. Uh, and so uh, we're going to work on this test to make it more readable. Before we do that, uh, we should also add a section about unfollowing because we want those statistics to be good and correct as well. So, okay. <laughs> Here's a section about unfollowing. Now we can see this test is getting really long. And let's say someone else is coming to this test. Uh, they need to update something. They probably don't want to look at this and try to figure out what is happening. So to make it more readable, one thing we could do is we could split it up into different sections, four sections. Uh, here's the setup here where I create the profiles. Here's some asserts about followers at the beginning, um, adding followers and asserts, and then removing followers. So that's a little more readable. To, do, to make it even better, I can add a comment at the top of each of these sections. So I'm creating three profiles. This one says no followers. Several profiles, 
follow other profiles and removing followers. That's a little better. Um, with some tests, it looks like this. Um, so that same comment is actually a comment here in subtests. Um, and I think from a quick look uh, at this test, it's a lot easier to say, okay, this is a test about followers. It looks like there's some setup at the top and three sections. And then in each section, there are comments about what's happening and what we're asserting. Uh, if one of them fails, then the failure will have this uh, comment. So, um, this is a great opportunity, or this is a great way that we can use subtests uh, to make our tests more readable. Because as I mentioned, if someone new is coming to our test suite and wants to know what's happening, this is a much easier, uh, this is a much easier test to understand what is actually happening. Okay, so readability is important because we want to know what's happening, uh, especially if I come back to this test in six months, 12 months, two years, or something like that, or if a new developer is coming to this code. Uh, I don't want to spend the time reading through it line by line trying to figure out what's happening. I'd rather spend my time fixing it or updating it. Uh, for companies, this means uh, employees are actually more interested in what they're doing because they're writing code. They're not deciphering someone else's uh, complicated tests, which means that you end up having better projects and more efficiency, so more money. Um, okay, one question. Why not just break up that test that I had, the really long test? Why not just break it up into three different sections? Uh, yes, we could do that as well. Um, however, one reason you might not want to do that is because that means we have to have the same setup for each test. And in some cases, it's not really a big deal. In other cases, if we have to uh, create some objects, um, some instances of one model, some instances of another model, um, if we have many, many to re relation, add some things there, that becomes complicated and it ends up being uh, not dry if we have to repeat that over and over. I'm sorry, did I get it? Yes, uh, I guess my, uh, so my thought was you could theoretically break it up into separate tests. And exactly like that, no, it would not work. Yes. Um, yeah, you could do it uh, a few different ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thorough tests. Okay, it's important to have thorough tests. Another example. Let's say we have a function here called is, is user error, and uh, it returns true for any user error, so meaning, meaning any status code that's uh, a 400 level status code. Okay, this is one way that we could test it. Uh, so we test for the 400, 401, 402, 403, and 405 status codes, and then some other common ones, 200, 201, 500, 503. Uh, this is okay. Um, for running code coverage, this would tell us that our function actually has 100% uh, coverage. But uh, this is actually not complete because there are other status codes that we're not testing here. So one way to make it more uh, thorough is we could write a line for every single status code between 400 and 500 and all the 200 ones and so on. But that's a lot. No one wants to read 100 lines of assert true. So we could do it in a for loop like this, uh, where we just loop through all the status codes or all the integers between 400 and 500 and assert that this function returns true. We could do it for all the 200 ones, all the 500 ones assert that it's false. That's fine, that's our row. But if something fails, then we get something like this. that just says assertion error, false is not true. And so we're left wondering, what failed? I don't know, something. Uh, with, the, with subtests, we can change uh, the test that I just mentioned with the for loop. There's the same for loop, and we just add put subtest status code equals status code. And this parameter ends up being uh, spit back out when something fails. And our failure looks something like this. So we would say 
assertion error false is not true, and that happens when the status code is 405. Um, question, should, can't we just do that with um, custom assert messages? We could, but if we write custom assert messages, then it's more maintenance because we would have to write that same message for each assert statement. And then if we ever want to change it, then it ends up being more complicated rather than just putting in one parameter. Uh, also, another thing to note is that subtests run independently. So if we have multiple failures, then we get all those failures back at once rather than just getting the first one like we would in a regular test. So if the status code 403 and 405 both failed, we would get something like this. And so we see them both at once. Um, this can be really helpful in diagnosing what the problem is in an application. So for example, this is a different test. I haven't told you what it's about. I haven't told you what it does. But if we have an assertion error here, we can see that we are expecting Jane, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and we're actually getting um, an empty space there. So we're off by one space for some reason. So that's without subtests. If I had put in uh, the parameters into subtests, we might be seeing something like this, where it says first name is Jane, last name is empty string, that fails. First name is empty string, last name is Smith, that also fails. So conclusion, our code does not handle empty strings. And so that's it's a lot easier to see that when we have all the failures right next to each other rather than trying to figure it out uh, from just the first failure. So not having, or actually, I talk about it. Okay. Uh, it's important to test all the parts of a function, not, not just one part of it. And some tests allow us to do that as well as having uh, useful error messages for each failure within our tests. Okay, section three, dry tests. Another example, let's say we have an API endpoint. We want to make sure that the right fields are required. So we have three fields. Uh, each of them is required at this point. It's first name, last name, and address. And in this test, it looks like we are um, posting to this endpoint. And we're doing it once here. We're doing it a second time here. And we're doing it a third time here. Really, we're just doing the same thing three times. So we could ask ourselves, is it clear what's being tested? Is this dry? Can we improve it? Yes, we can improve it. For example, we could put comments on each section. It does improve it. It makes it more readable. But still, we're doing the same thing three times. So one way you could do it, one way you could improve this with subtests is like this. I defined a function up here. It's get minimum required data, and it returns uh, first name, last name, and address. These are, these are all the required fields. And so I could have a test that make sure that those required fields work. Uh, down here, I define my missing subtests. And this is a tuple of a field name and the subtest description. So each of the field names are here, first name, last name, and address. And we have a description for each of them. Uh, sorry, which one? The big one. Oh, um, the big one. This would be in the test case. So this is just a helper method for the test case, and then this is a test within the test case. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. It looks like the underscores, for some reason, got cut out here. There should be a, yeah, an underscore in each of these spaces. I apologize for that. Um, we loop through each field name and subtest description. We get the data. Um, we do. We take out the field name, and then we post to the endpoint and make sure that the status code is 400. Uh, okay, so why is this better? It's better because if something is required, uh, or if something is changed about the required fields, like for example, if we add a new one, all we have to do is just add one more line here, and then this test continues to work. We don't have to um, look through several different sections about where these things are defined in our test suite. Uh, if one of these fields becomes optional, then we could just take it out. Or if the endpoint ends up having 15 different required fields, then we can just add to our tuple of tuples. Um, also, since things are defined neatly, it's more readable. If someone else wants to look through all the fields that are required, they're just right here. Uh, 
Um, so having dry testing code is important. Uh, less code, uh, it's less code for me to read through, and it's less code for other developers to read through. If, uh, similar to as how I mentioned before, if a new developer is coming to this uh, test suite and trying to update tests, I would rather have them just read through one test rather than having to um, look at the same thing uh, defined multiple times or looking through different posts uh, within the tests, within different tests or within a test suite. It's easier to maintain because we just define things in one place. And subtests give us a great way uh, to write code that is dry. Um, so in summary, uh, readability matters since someone's gonna have to read through a test. It could be me, it could be somebody else, and subtests allow us to have readable tests. Uh, subtests allow us to be more thorough and to have um, messages when things fail that are actually useful for us. So we can have code that's uh, thorough as well as really useful when things fail. Subtests allow us to be dry um, because they're another way, another tool for us to have dry tests. Where I work at Cactus, we strive to have good code, good testing, good documentations, and subtests have been really helpful for us for doing that. So did they solve all of our testing problems? No, they did not. There are still lots of ways that people can write bad code. Uh, you can have bad comments or no comments. You can have confusing variable names. You can have huge amounts of setup as well as other things. But subtests are a way for us uh, to have good tests. Uh, they're another tool that we can use to have tests that are readable and dry and thorough. Can you do this with other testing libraries? Absolutely. If you like using uh, Nose or PyTest, sure, you can use those. But you don't have to because subtests are now a part of the Python standard library. Um, as of Python 3.4, they're just there. So if you don't want to go through and learn PyTest, then you don't have to. You can just write subtests as long as you have Python 3.4. So whether you use them or not, uh, they are there for you uh, for writing readable, thorough, and draft tests. So this is my contact information. I'm Dimitri. My talk is subtests are the best. If you were expecting something else, this is what you're going to get. <laughs> My name is Dmitry Chukin. I work at the Cactus Group as a backend developer. Um, I have been working there for a couple of years previously. I worked as a math teacher, and I spent a couple of years learning Python, doing free online tutorials, working on some projects with friends. Um, and now I'm at Cactus. Uh, Cactus, for those who don't know, is a web development company in Durham, North Carolina. A few new libraries, we know when deprecation warnings uh, tell us something's going to be deprecated. We want to use tests so that uh, we know when something actually breaks without having to rely on the users in production code. Uh, plus, if I can catch a bug in my code, then I'm not using somebody else's QA time to uh, actually find a bug, and I'm not relying on users, because uh, then nobody's happy. So testing makes uh, our code more efficient, and it reduces our technical debt. Great, so we all agree testing is important, we should all do tests, but this talk isn't actually about tests specifically, I'm talking about subtests. So I'm gonna get to that in a minute. One more thing about testing. Um, so the rest of this talk is mostly gonna be about how tests, uh, good tests are readable, thorough, and dry. So number one, readable. Uh, we want to make sure that other developers who are getting to our tests actually understand them uh, without having to spend lots of time digging through them, checking each line, being sure they understand what each of the variables mean, things like that. We want to make sure that they're thorough so that we're testing our functions, our classes, our endpoints. Uh, we're not just checking that they exist, but that they actually work the way they're supposed to. And we want to make sure that they're dry. So we don't want to be writing the same lines of code in multiple places. Uh, by the way, these principles are taken from uh, the Zen of Python, like readability counts, beautiful is better than 
We specialize in web maps projects using Django, as well as a few other uh, projects not specific to Django. So that's what we do. OK, uh, testing is important. So uh, testing is important because we want to make sure that the code works. We want to write tests that uh, are actually there for a purpose. We want to make sure that our actual code runs the way that we want it to. We want to make sure uh, at Cactus we write lots of tests um, to make sure that when we upgrade 